basically, I'm not going to lie, learning to drive is really expensive, but for me it was definitely worth the independence that came out of it. Hello everybody and welcome back to Elder Law Student. So today's video is really highly requested. It's all about driving as a student, so how you can afford to do that, um, my experiences with that, learning to drive, insurance, all these kind of things. I asked on Instagram what you would like me to like cover in this video. Um, I'm not going to structure this as a Q&A type thing because there was just basically so many questions from a whole range of perspectives. A lot of them were very similar and so I just thought I'd basically go through my experience and as I go answer those questions. Okay so the first one was um, what's the minimum age for getting a driving licence? Um, so as far as I'm aware, and I'm pretty sure this is accurate, basically in the UK you can get your provisional licence when you're 16 years old. Um, your provisional your, your provisional licence um, is quite useful to get even if you're not planning on learning to drive because it's a good form of photo ID that you can keep with you. And it's a green card, I don't have one because obviously I've got my pink one now. You can get one of those when you're 16, however you can't start learning to drive until you're 17 on the road, so you can do it on private land and there are some places where you might be able to go and learn to drive before then. But to go on the road you have to be 17 years old and you have to have a provisional driving licence. So basically 17 is the minimum age that you could drive a car on the road and pass your test and that kind of thing. But I got my provisional licence when I was 16, kind of nearly 17 and I booked my first driving lesson in the August and I turned 17 in the October. The reason I did that was because I was so nervous about learning to drive. This is just something that I've had ever since I was about 10. I was literally just terrified about learning to drive and I don't know why but basically the reason that I booked my first driving lesson in the August was so that I didn't have to worry about it in October. Um, I gave myself a week between my birthday and my first driving lesson I believe. In terms of choosing a driving instructor, um, I think if I remember rightly my first driving instructor was the person who taught the girl next door. Going through recommendations is a really great way to do it but also just a quick google search will find you some really good driving instructors. By far the biggest thing um, that I got asked was how did I afford learning to drive and insurance and all that kind of thing um, and in this video I'm going to be totally like open and honest about it because I didn't fund it all myself. I wouldn't have been able to fund it all myself but I did fund a significant proportion of it. So for my 17th birthday one set of grandparents gave me £200 towards learning to drive. Um, I think the main motivation behind that is that my granddad was a mechanic and just in general they've always been very into the idea of like learning to drive and being able to drive and that sort of thing. That £200 covered my first 10 hours worth of driving lessons. £200 for 10 hours worth of lessons is actually really cheap um, but I'll go into some details a bit later about why I probably should have spent a bit more money. I also got some money from my other set of grandparents. Again, just ridiculously helpful. I'm so, so grateful for that. The rest of the cost was made up by me. So at the time, and I still do, I had a part-time job. So I would work Sundays at the local garden centre as a waitress. I was on minimum wage and basically for the entire year that I was 17, all of my wages just went on learning to drive. In the end, I was trying to figure this out earlier today and I'm not quite sure, I think I had between 25 and 30 hours of lessons. I passed my test on the first try, um, but the reason that it took me so long was because I had some real issues with driving instructors. I um, started out with one driving instructor, but I would always get text messages saying, oh I'll have to cancel our lesson for next week and this that and the other. It's just not helpful at all. I didn't feel like I was making any progress. I was getting so nervous between lessons because I just wasn't used to it. I wasn't getting used to driving at all. Um, and so by the June, July time um, I switched instructors. My new driving instructor was fantastic. Um, he was so helpful. He basically had me going out driving twice a week and I ended up having maybe 
10 hours worth of lessons with him but in the space of not very long at all. However, something else that I should point out is that at the same time I did have my own car. Now this is where a lot of people ask me questions. So yes, I did have my own car whilst I was learning to drive. I got my first car in the March, so six months after I'd started learning to drive. Now the reason I got my own car um, is different to most people basically. My grandma went to buy herself a new set of windscreen wipers and she came away deciding to buy a new car. <laughs> and so that is how I got my 2003 Polo. The trade-in value of the car was next to nothing and so she basically gave me the car which I was, I, I mean, it was the most amazing present <laughs> ever. Um, but that was such a massive help. It took me a while to kind of get the confidence to drive that car because at the time, as I said, I'd really not had many hours of driving lessons. However, as time went on, I did start to go out driving with my dad and in probably like the fortnight before my driving test, I went out every single night without fail in that car with my dad. So that is super helpful if you can do that. And you understand that not everybody is in that position and me having a car was a complete like stroke a look basically. However that didn't make insurance any cheaper so um, insurance was a lot of money. <laughs> um, I can't remember exactly how things were divided up. I put towards my insurance all of the money I had. Basically if you don't know um, learner driver insurance is insane. It was over a thousand pounds a year and um, it, yeah it's a lot of money. I've now had car insurance since 2017 and so in those three years um, it's just dropped, it's halved um, and that's because I've had my own car with my own name on it with my in, like insurance in my own name. In the long run it is worth it but at the time it's painful <laughs> and you know if I was to learn to drive now I couldn't afford to do that but obviously at the time I was doing my A-levels um, all of my wages were disposable income. It's just about prioritising money if you've got a part-time job. Okay, so then after I passed my test. Now you might have heard me talking about a blue 2003 polo and you might be thinking, hang on, you've got a mini now because you might have seen it in my Instagram stories. That is not by choice. <laughs> so without going into too much detail, in March of 2018, yeah, 2018, um, I was driving my parents home one night, there was somebody driving in the middle of the road coming in the opposite direction. Turns out this person was drink driving and my car was completely written off but thankfully um, everybody came out of it uninjured. It did take me a very long time to become comfortable driving again properly um, because that was a really scary experience. Poor car. However, because obviously that accident, not accident, it's not an accident is it? That incident um, was not my fault then it meant that um, the other person's insurance company paid for my car and everything. With that um, I bought myself a Mini. My car is still an old car, um, it's 2007 so it's newer than my old car. It's definitely not perfect, the gear stick pops out second gear and the passenger door doesn't work and all these things but it's a safe car and it's got four wheels and it runs. Okay so now on to just like general tips um, and answering all of your questions that I've probably not covered in that bit of a spiel about how I learned to drive, all these sorts of things. Just looking through the questions now. Most of them are about insurance and like which car to pick if you're going to buy a car and all these sorts of things. Um, so for me, the make and model of my first car was a 2003 Polo. It was a diesel. Um, I feel like there's more to it than that, but that's what my car was. Polos are quite, um, common for like first driver cars and um, they're not the cheapest to insure by any means. Obviously for me it worked out really well, I didn't pay for the car so it's very much different for me than for other people I assume. My Mini is far cheaper to insure. What you want to be doing when you pick a first car, um, if you want something to be 
more affordable then you want a smaller less powerful car so basically don't get a diesel so examples of these might be things like Peugeot 107s uh, C1s they're all the same kind of thing they've just got different badges on them I know a lot of people like Fiat 500s I'm not a massive fan I don't think they're great cars but I think they're relatively cheap to insure you have to park your car on the road then your insurance will go up because obviously your car is more at risk of being hit and that kind of thing but if it's um, on the drive or in a garage then that will bring down your insurance cost. If you can get a parent as a named driver on that car, so for example on my car, um, on my insurance, I am the like the, the person whose name the insurance is under, does that make sense? Um, but then my parents are both named drivers on my car. Something else that will really bring down your insurance is to have a black box. I know a lot of people hate black boxes, but I couldn't have afforded to insure my car without a black box. Um, if you don't know what it is, it basically goes inside your car, um, the insurance company will come to fit it and it goes in there and it tracks when you're driving your car, um, your speed, your smoothness. Now I thought I'd explain a bit about what I do with my car now that I'm at university. At university in Oxford, um, the majority of places you can't have a car. Um, actually when I was looking at other universities as well in your first year you can't take a car down with you. In alternative circumstances there's a good chance that I would have just got rid of my car because it's it's a huge expense. I mean you've got to pay for insurance, you've got to pay for fuel, you've got to pay for road tax, you've got to pay for your MOT, you've got to pay for all of these things. However I do still have my car and um, it stays up here in Sheffield. I've basically made my car the most functional car it can be for the whole family. My car now has tyres on it that are really good in the snow. It's also been converted into like a dog van so it's been turned into a two-seater. We've put the back seats down, we've put some wooden planks in the back and we've got a dog guard in there so both the dogs can fit in there easily and can take them out and it's got like a big black sheet thing in it that's washable so the muddy dogs can go in there and it's all fine. The black box has been taken out because um, First of all, now I'm older and I've had insurance for a few more years, um, my insurance has gone down a lot anyway, so it doesn't cost me that much to insure my car. Because it's now been more of a family car, uh, the cost is definitely shared a lot more than with my old car and before I went to university. 